we give our worship team a round of applause? Thank you. You may be seated. Well, welcome to Transformation Church. Uh, whether you're watching online or you're in the building, uh, we're so glad that you're here today. And if you are a first time guest, um, we wanna welcome you and we want to let you know this is a safe place. And I was actually thinking when we were just singing that song, um, you, many of you were here last week when Pastor Paul preached that incredible yeah. message, right? <laughs> and one of our values is, um, we, or part of our vision, but that we're multi-generational. And uh, Pastor Paul and his wife Sandy have been married 15 years longer than us. They're coming up on 45, we're coming up on 30. And um, yeah, yeah, that's a, we can clap for that. And uh, that statement, um, I'm gonna make it through. Mm. I can't tell you how many times I've called Pastor Paul or gone to him when we've gone through something, like with our family, and I'll be like, just, you're alive, tell me how you made it. And he'd say, you're gonna make it through. Mm -hmm. And so maybe that's why you're here today, because you need to hear those words. So, um, also, will you join us in welcoming all of our correctional facility partnerships? Is it my turn? Mm -hmm. I was so enamored and in awe of your beauty, I just oh. wanted to keep going. <laughs> Ain't no woman like the one I got. <laughs> so hey, <laughs> let's give it up for the mamas. Let's, uh, let's thank the mamas on this, on this Mother's Day. Yeah, yep. And uh, I know that some of you have, uh, your mothers have gone on to be with the Lord and I know it's a tough time. And uh, for many of you, your mothers through helping to raise other people's children. But one thing that I know, you know, um, James Brown said, it's a man's world, but it'll be nothing, nothing without a woman or a girl. So let's give it up for the women. So listen, I'm now gonna get recruited for the worship team, but I'm gonna say no, so I got too much to do. But speaking of Mother's Day, I got a Mother's Day gift for my mama over here, not like mama, you know what I mean, my mama, mama, not, okay. Baby mama, baby mama, every, baby mama. y'all know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. All right, we got these cute little models here. Now these children are not our own, although they look like. I know, they do they look could like be they could be our own. Thank you, These are the Hoover's kids, yeah. Come here, Sophia. Yeah, thank you very much, thank you. Thank you, princess. Appreciate it. They're my favorite, thank you guys. Sophia, you know I need the power, young lady, all right. See you later. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, Thank you. so um, you're welcome. Mm -hmm. See, that's how you do it, fellas. I'm trying to tell you now. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Hey, um, so we're continuing our series, Color Blessed. What in the world does color blessed mean? It's based off the second part of my book, How We Heal Our Racial Divide. But when we use color blessed, we're talking about Jesus' family, his church, is a color blessed church, not a colorblind church. Where do we get that from? Well, let's go to eternity future. The new heavens, new earth. Uh, no more pain, no more sickness, uh, no more invasion of countries, no more all the junk that we deal with, right? It, it is the resurrection in the new heavens, new earth. And Revelation 5.9 says this, that there's going to be every nation, tribe, and tongue in the new heavens and new earth. It's going it's to be color blessed, not colorblind. So we're going to take our ethnicities and our cultures with us. The Puerto Ricans are going to be Puerto Ricans. The Mexicans are going to be Mexicans. The Koreans are going to be Koreans. The white people are going to be white people. And all oh, everybody's going to be fully redeemed to who we were created to be. It's going to be color blessed. Where does that come from? Let's go to the past. In Genesis chapter 12, the living God of the universe tells a man by the name of Abram, and he changes his name to Abraham, and he says this, I'm going to give you a big family made up of all the families of the earth. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the nation of Israel, and through the nation of Israel comes Abraham's seed, King Jesus. So Jewish Messiah, King Jesus, God the Son in human flesh, lives a sinless life, dies a death we should have died in our place on the cross, raises from the dead, is in his throne at the right hand of the Father as Lord and King, sends the Holy Spirit, and guess what happens? You and I are Jesus handing his Father this beautiful multi-ethnic family 
that he promised. So l- l- listen, the gospel is more than forgiving our sins. What good would it be to forgive your sins and you can still be a racist, a bigot, and a jerk? No, he forgives our sins, fills us with his life. He forgives our sins to give us a family with different colored skins. And as we love each other, something beautiful happens. But in order for that to take place, we want to develop a color-blessed culture. It just doesn't happen by accident. You have to be intentional. Yeah, so let's talk about what culture is. Culture is not what we say, it's what we do. It's the behaviors of individuals within a family which create accountability and momentum if it's a healthy culture. Let me give you an example. You've probably even heard this one before. Um, There's a restaurant, uh, it's a fast food restaurant nearby here, and when you go through the drive-through and um, they give you your food and you give them your money and you say thank you, they say, my pleasure. (laughs) Chick-fil-A. There are others that you go through the drive-through and you say thank you and they go, no problem. Like, oh, sorry, I was bothering you. I interrupted you to give you my money. Um, So that's a culture. They work on developing a culture of customer service and a culture of gratitude. Another example is here at Transformation Church from the very beginning. So we planted Transformation Church a little over 12 years ago. And from the very beginning, it was really important to us since we didn't grow up going to church, um, we wanted everybody to feel welcome. And so we have always taught our welcome team or the hospitality team, greeters, uh, parking attendants, et cetera, to be kind, to be friendly, to be patient. Those are behaviors that make you feel welcome. Last, when you walk into this building, there are people that will watch our services online and they'll be like, okay, they they look like they might be multi-ethnic. I, I can't quite tell. Um, but when they come in and they sit in a service, they're like, whoa. The behavior is you have black people, white people, Latino people, Asian people all sitting together, serving on the team together, worshiping together, together, preaching together. And so it is an intentional culture. It's a behavior that we have intentionally created. Yes, and these behaviors cultivate unity. Um, On a count of three, in a Rick James voice, I want you to say, unity. Ready? One, two, three. Man, even the white people did good. Let's give it up for our white brothers and sisters. And by the way, if you're new here, we joke a lot. We don't take ourselves seriously, but we take Jesus very seriously. So what does unity mean? Unity means this. We can have differences but be unified with a common purpose. And our common purpose is to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And we're unified on a mission to let the world know that there's a loving father who wants to adopt all types of children into his family so that they could be his hands and his feet on this planet. We're unified around that. Uniformity, teenagers, means this, that everybody's the same. We look the same, talk the same. That would be so boring and so unlike God. If you think about the fish of the sea, y'all know I'm a fisherman. You think about the fish of the sea, the bird, like, like, like God loves that. So he doesn't want us to be colorblind. He wants us to be color blessed. And culture creates unity and empowers the vision of the family to flourish individually and collectively. Why is that important for those of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus because his reputation is on the line. I'm gonna read to you John 13, 34, 35. Teenagers, put this in your pocket. Listen to this. Jesus says this, let me give you a new command. Notice it doesn't say a new suggestion. It says, let me give you a new command. Love one another. Now, let me pause here. Uh, We live in a culture that talks about love, but what does love actually mean? If we want to know the greatest definition of love, we look at the cross. Love is sacrificial. Love is selfless. Love 
is desiring the highest good for another. Love is not passive in the midst of conflict. Love runs into conflict with grace in our hands. Love is not just a feeling, because feelings come and go. Love is anchored in God himself. It goes on, in the same way I loved you. So Jesus is speaking to his disciples. Now, here's what's happening. For three years, his Jewish disciples had been with him. He's letting them know, hey, by the way, um, I'm about to die, and I'm going to be gone. And you know what his disciples are doing? They're, listen to this. They're arguing about who's going to be the greatest in his kingdom. And Jesus says, I want you to love each other the way I loved you. And what did he do? He put on an outer garment and he got on his knees and he washed his disciples' feet. Love is humble. Love is I'm going to serve you. Love is don't consider or consider others better than yourselves. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Love looks like Jesus washing feet. Love does not look like arguing on Facebook all day as though it's our job. Besides, how are you going to convince someone that Jesus is who he is if you're mad at him? I just don't remember Jesus like, you dirty, rotten sinners, y'all terrible. You know the people that he got on the most? The religious establishment. The sinners, he's like, hey, pull up a chair, let's eat some food together. And you know what the religious folks did? They called him a glutton and a drunkard, which are cuss words in the first century Jewish world. Then it says, this is how everyone will recognize that you're my disciples. Notice, it doesn't say you will recognize that you're my disciples because you're Republican or Democrat. Of course, you guys know that that wasn't around in Jesus' day. Everybody understand that? I just want to make, make sure. And so, for like 1,800 years, the church was okay without America's political categories. Everybody understand that? Are we okay? If that's true, then... I'm not saying don't vote. I vote all the time. Too many black folks died for the right of an American citizen to vote. So hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I mean, I feel you. I'm a vote, but I know that my greatest vote was already given to Jesus and his kingdom, which is going to put me at odds with both parties most of the time. Yep. I'm still going to respect them. I'm a citizen. I appreciate the golf claps up here. Okay, I appreciate it. But you will know that you're my disciples by the way you love one another. Friends, if we allow God to shape us like that, not only will your life be better, but you and I will make this world better. This world does not lack rudeness. This world, I mean, this world, yeah, does not lack rudeness, Selfishness, what it lacks is people to love. And that's why Jesus said, I'm leaving you here to replace me and to reproduce me. And it says, when they see that you have love for each other. This is the church that Jesus, is, that Jesus wants. And this is the church that Vicki and I want to serve and lead. And I know that this is what you want as well. Now, the devil doesn't like that. He loves to keep us divided. He loves to keep, keep us angry. But God's love is greater than what the enemy wants to do. The devil came to steal, kill, and destroy, but Christ came to give life and give it abundantly, and we're going to cling to it. We're going to trust him to be able to do it. So what I did is this, is in the, in the last part of my book, is I wrote what's called the five points of the reconciler's creed. On the count of three, say creed with me. One, two, three, creed. What is a creed? Not the rock band from back in the day, creed. They were dope, but that's not what I'm talking about. A creed is a set of theological statements that allow us to remember God's truth so we can actually live God's truth. The scene of the crime is your mind. Scene of the crime is your mind. So what we want to do is replace lies with truth. We want truth to motivate us. So the Reconciler's Creed is it looks like a cross. And in the middle of it, the heartbeat is worship. And we're going to define worship in this case as this. When we love God by loving other people, that's worship. 
That's the greatest form of worship is to love other people. Loving people don't mean you got to agree with everything. But loving people means I have the highest good in mind for you because of Christ's love for me. Then we're going to look at justification, which means God declares all of his people his very own righteousness. And we're going to give practical implications. And in the next few weeks, we're going to talk about unity. We're going to talk about guard. And we're going to talk about holiness. So these theological creed is going to give us guardrails so that we can tear down demonic strongholds. Let me give you an example. And in a moment, Vicky's gonna read 2 Corinthians 10, three. But here's an example of a stronghold. I love my granddad. He was the hardest working man that I've ever, ever seen. That's where I learned work ethic from. But when I was a little boy, he would make comments about Jewish people. I'm quite sure in the hood in San Antonio, Texas, I don't think any of my friends were Jews. We're primarily Mexican, black, and we had one white guy. His name was Golden Boy. He had blonde hair. He'd pop willies down the street, and we'd be like, there go Golden Boy. Okay, I don't even know his real name was Golden Boy. But he would make these comments about Jewish people all the time. Never met a Jewish person. And one of my teammates with the... uh, Apple's Colts was Jewish, and we were having a conversation, and I made some of the same statements that my granddad did. And I caught myself, and I went, bro, I'm so sorry, man. I'm like, you're the first actual Jewish person I have ever met. And I apologized profusely, but that was a mental stronghold that the devil got a hold of to make me bigoted towards someone I had never met before. Let's fast forward years, about four years ago, I was doing a football camp and my son Jeremiah was with me and my former teammate was there. So I introduced them and I told my son about the story and the prejudice that I had against a group of people I had never met before. And I told my son that story because I didn't want him to repeat it. Well, I'm telling you this story because Jesus doesn't want us to repeat it. People are made in the image of God. Therefore, don't just look at the cover. Open up the pages. We might actually learn something. And it isn't amazing that I worship a Jewish Messiah and got my doctoral work in first century, second temple Jewish context. The Lord like, how about that, homie? You're going to speak a little... Shema Israel, Adonai Eleheno, Adonai Echad. <laughs> the Lord, like, I'll show you. So listen, listen, listen to this text there. Second Corinthians 10, three through five says this. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments in every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So what does that mean? It means, first of all, that every thought that comes into your mind, you don't have to believe it. Say it again. Every thought that comes into your mind, you don't have to believe it. In fact, we should get good at questioning the thoughts that come into our mind. And when it's talking about um, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, that's against God's word. So when a thought comes in your mind, it's really helpful to get into the practice of comparing it with what God's word says. Now, first, you gotta know what God's word says to be able to compare it, right? Shout out to the spiritual formation team, okay? And so, um, but what happens is, if that thought comes in, you compare it to the word of God and it doesn't match up, who's wrong? Your thought or the word of God? Your thought, okay. So, we learn to take those thoughts captive. What that means is, Picture wallpaper in your mind, right? Like in a bathroom, you got wallpaper in your mind and you got a thought running through your mind. Ask God to help you examine, is that from God or not? If it doesn't match up to his word, then you tear that thought down and you replace it with the truth of God's word because what you think about is gonna determine how you act and how you treat others. Amen, amen, yeah. So, 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 
most of us sabotage relationships before the relationship even ever starts because of the voices that we hear. And we believe that a lot of times those are demonic voices. You're not worthy. No one's going to love you. You shouldn't even be here. You, you don't deserve this. And so you're getting all these you. Whenever you hear you, that's from dark powers. Mm -hmm. And so don't believe everything you think and be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's why we teach and preach the way we do, and we want you to be in the Word of God because we want to wallpaper our mind with God's truth. And so we're going to look at this gospel culture, this color-blessed culture to build Jesus' church. So the first behavior that we're going to talk about in a color-blessed culture is worship. We will relentlessly worship God by loving our brothers and sisters of different ethnicities in Christ. So I grew up in Montana, and in Montana there are seven Native American reservations. Um, so we used to go to different uh, schools, obviously, when we were playing sports when I was growing up. And um, we went to this one reservation that's near Flathead Lake. Many of you know about that lake. Um, but several times a year, we would go there for different sporting events. And when we would drive onto the reservation and there's signs that'll say like, you know, welcome to the um, Salish Kootenai Reservation or something like that, um, you immediately see a difference. And when I was younger, I just really didn't understand like, why, like, what does this even mean? Why are we coming here? Why does it look like this? I, I couldn't wrap my mind around a group of people being put on this reservation that looked really, really poor. And so this is before I was a Christian. And even then, it, it really bothered me. And to this day, um, when he wants to watch a movie either about Native Americans or about slavery, I won't do it. I won't. Because it like, literally tears my insides out to think about people being treated that way. And this isn't to bash America, like this happens all over the world. Um, and as Christians, that should never be so. It's one thing if the world acts that way. As Christians, we are called to love our brothers and sisters in Christ and that we gotta tear down the lies that we believe about people that look different than us or that come from different countries than us. And we have to replace those lies with the truth of who God says those people are. Made in the image of God, yeah. So, so, so every human being that we're gonna come in contact with, what we see here at Transformation Church is this. Every person Jesus died for, if every person is worth Jesus dying for, then we are worth giving every person love to see every person made in the image and likeness of God. Where do we get this from? We get this from Matthew chapter 22, 37 through 39. It says this. This is Jesus. He said to him, speaking to a religious scholar, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. Why does God tell us to do that? Because whatever we love the most is gonna shape our lives. If you wanna know what you love the most, look at your checking account and look at what brings you the most anxiety and fear. When we love Jesus the most, when we love the Father, the Spirit the most, God gets the most out of us. He says, this is the greatest and most important command. This is like it. Love, the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Think about it. The way you treat other people is a reflection of what you think about yourself. Let me talk to the teenage young ladies that are getting bullied online. Number one, don't listen to it. Number two, feel sorry for them because for them to treat you that way is a, is a direct reflection of what's in their own heart. The way you treat other people is a microscope into your soul. People who are angry and visceral and always yep. wanna tear you yep. down, they're projecting what's inside of them. Pity them, pray for them, but don't participate in their shenanigans. Yeah. Get this finger and hit duh to the leet. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. There you go. Yeah. So according to Jesus, loving God and loving others are the greatest commandments, and they go together. 
First John 4, 19 through 21 says, we love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and yet hates his brother or sister, he is a liar. Let, 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 me, let me pause here. This is really, really important. Sometimes we want to get ourselves off the hook here, and we'll say, well, I don't hate anybody. I'm just indifferent. Well, this word hate, when it's used in the New Testament, is not simply disdain, it's indifference. Mm -hmm. it's, it's also not caring. It's, mm -hmm. well, that's not my problem. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but I'm so thankful that in the eternal counsel of the Father, Son, and Spirit, that when the Godhead knew that we human beings was going to mess up earth and introduce sin into to the world, that Jesus didn't say, yo, Dad, I could go save them, but that ain't my problem. I don't have any sin. And, and that's kind of what we do, but when we follow Jesus, we want to take upon his character and his image that I am my brother's keeper, that I am my sister's keeper, that when there's a problem, God can use me to be a solution. And oftentimes what we do is we go, well, that doesn't affect my political party. Um, that doesn't affect people who look like me. That's demonic thinking. Jesus came and said, sin is not my problem, but because it is a problem, Problem and I love people, I'm going to be the solution to the problem. That same Jesus lives in you, that same Jesus lives in me, and he's calling us to the same mission. I just wonder, I just wonder if we prayed to be the hands and feet of Jesus as much as we pay for him to pay our bills if the world would change. I just wonder if we prayed for that as much as we pray for God to make our dreams come true if the world would be different. Okay, when you get to a certain age, say like 45, 50, by the way, you don't have to wait that long, you kind of figure out that's not all it was cracked up to be. And here's why. We're allowing the world to dictate to us what satisfaction and purpose is, and Jesus, like I already told you, to live a life of love where you are the answer to someone's prayers and he keeps giving us enough grace and what will happen is our souls expand. We get larger, we get better, we get more beautiful and then your kids ain't gotta lie at your funeral. No, seriously, you ever been to a funeral and you're like, you talking about that person? Right there? You ain't talking about them. Like, we want to live a life where there's a long line of pe pe people going, I can testify to this person's love. I can testify to this person's mercy and graciousness. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the rest of the, the verse says, for the person who does not love his brother or sister whom he has seen cannot love God, God who he has not seen. And we have this command from him, the one who loves God must also love his brother and sister. And this is the kind of church that we want Transformation Church to be. This is the church we wanna serve. This is the church that we planted, is we want people to learn, we want ourselves to grow in understanding that you can't separate loving God and loving people and wanting him to show us if we are doing it differently. And his grace is sufficient. He will show us and then he will love us through it. Mm -hmm. Amen, amen. So um, in 1995, this is way back in the day, teenagers before Google and iPhones and all that stuff, um, I had a former career where I played for the Indianapolis Colts, and I want to show you a team photo from back in the day. Can you guys find me in it? Let me see. Can y'all know where I'm at? I, I put it on Twitter the other day, and somebody said I was a whole different human, so I'm like, Lord, have mercy. But anyway, I'm number 30. I'm right next to the head coach right there, but this particular team, um, I was one of four team captains, and we surprised the NFL. Uh, we made it to the playoffs as a wild card. So we went to San Diego, and we beat them boys bad. Number one, because they lived in San Diego, and we lived in Indianapolis. They lived in paradise. We lived in a frozen tundra. They needed to be beat down. Then we went, <laughs> then we went to play the Kansas City Chiefs. And the Chiefs were the number one seed that time. They had a running back by the name of Marcus Allen. It was like three below zero. Man, we beat them down too. It was great. Then we had to travel to Pittsburgh to play the Steelers. 
I see you raising your hands over there. Remember, we have to love everybody. Even? <laughs> just playing. Even? Yeah, okay, I'm just all right. Playing. This is a discipleship moment. Discipleship I love you. Moment. Yeah. Love is not a feeling, it's a commitment. <laughs> so for 58 minutes, we wore them dudes out. If they'd had instant replay back then, we may have made it to the Super Bowl because a guy named Cordell Stewart ran out of bounds, caught a touchdown pass to take the lead. I'm over it. I've gotten counseling. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> but you know what's interesting about this team is we had white players, black players, some Asian, some Latino. We were different, different shapes, different sizes, different colors, but we all wore the same jersey. Yeah. When you and I come to Jesus, when we fall to our knees and we realize that he wants to forgive us, that he wants to love us, he also declares us righteous and gives us a new jersey. It's called being clothed in Christ. Why does God do that? Teenagers, here's why. We got to understand that that God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is, is not our homeboy. He, 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 he's what the Bible calls holy and, and transcendent, and, and he is utterly righteous and perfect, and we are not. But because God loves us, he sends Jesus to do what? To be an embodiment of that love, but he also sends Jesus to be the righteousness that we could never be. So when he forgives us, it's a sign of his love, but not only forgiving us, he goes, I'm going to bring you into my righteousness. I'm going to give you a new jersey over your ethnic culture. You're still going to be black or white or Asian, Latino, male, female, but we're now all going to be wearing the righteousness of Jesus. So, 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 so when God the Father sees us, he goes, I see the righteousness of Jesus. When we look in the mirror, we go, I see the righteousness of Jesus. And when we see our brothers and sisters of every nation, tribe, and tongue, immigrants at the border, immigrants in Ukraine, in Syria, and in China, and in Brazil, and in Fort Mill, and in Charlotte, and in Ballantyne, and all over, if you are on Team Jesus, we're all wearing the righteousness of Christ. So how in the world can we look down on somebody that's wearing the same clothes we are? Think about it. Justification means this. We will relentlessly see our brothers and sisters of other ethnicities as the righteousness of God in Christ. Why? Because we're all covered in the same justifying blood. Like, I was so thankful that Jesus loved me and forgave me. But when I learned about the justifying blood, some other things took place. People go, so you grew up as a compulsive stutterer. Did you go to speech therapy? What happened? I said, well, I learned about the justifying blood of Jesus. They go, what do you mean? I said, well, I recognize that a lot of my stuttering was rooted in trauma. Um, I grew up in a very chaotic, violent environment. Um, I grew up in an environment where Oftentimes, I felt neglected or ignored. I grew up very poor. What y'all call bullying today was normal. Uh, maybe you call it getting roasted. We called it getting bagged on, but I wanted no one to know where I lived. My dad wasn't around, and so there was just this poor self-image. But when I realized that the living God of the universe declared me righteous, that when he said, Derwin, when I look at you, you're not only loved, you're not only forgiven, you're the very righteousness of my son, King Jesus. I began to see myself in a new way. I began to talk in a new way. I began to realize, man, I could go to school and get a master's degree and a doctorate degree. I realized, man, I could plant a church. I realized all that God could call me to be simply because I realized he made me a new me. So the doctrine of justification goes upward, inward, and then it moves us outward to go, God, if you see me that way, should I not see my brothers and sisters that way? It's powerful. Romans 3, 22 through 24 says, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Nothing else, belief. 
There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. You all know Gentile is a non-Jew. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So we got married in college, and we moved to Indianapolis, where he was drafted by the Colts. And our last couple of years in college, I was really seeking. Um, neither one of us grew up in church, didn't know the Lord. And um, I had just had kind of a traumatic past, mostly at my own hand. And so I just had like this giant hole in my heart is basically what I can say and just a darkness in my soul that I would just, I was miserable. And so I think we both thought, you know, once he makes it to the NFL, everything's gonna be great. Like, isn't that, isn't that what's supposed to happen? Like, it's gonna fill that hole in my heart and everything's gonna be great and I'll have no more sadness or disappointment or hurt. I'll immediately forgive all the people that ever hurt me. I won't feel bad about the people I hurt. Well, we like to say God set us up because we get to the NFL and we're looking at each other like, uh -huh, this is it? Like, mm -hmm. like, maybe our outsides look better, but our insides aren't any better. In fact, our insides might be worse than what they were before. And so um, frequently when he would go out of town on road trips, um, I would usually just stay in Indianapolis for the weekend because I was working at the time. And I would go to this really old traditional Presbyterian church that was uh, downtown in Indianapolis. And uh, it had like, you know, the big stained glass windows and, and all that. And the only reason I went there was because I was told I was baptized Presbyterian as a baby, like when I was two weeks or something, I don't even know. And so I thought, well, that must be where I'm supposed to go. And, you know, to like check off the good deeds. And so I would go to this church um, occasionally when I felt like I needed to um, get some good points with God. And hopefully those good things would outweigh the bad things. Um, that I knew I had done or I knew that were inside me. And um, one day I, I went to this church and I don't even remember, I don't even know if I paid attention to what the pastor was saying to be truthful with you. Um, I just knew I wanted to like do a good deed. And so I would sit in the very back of this massive church because I didn't want anybody to come talk to me. And like, don't try to get my phone number and call me. Don't like try to get my address and come visit me because I'm just doing a good deed. I don't wanna do more than that. That's all I'm doing, that's what I'm here for. So I would sit in the back of this church and one time in particular, I was, I was sitting in the back and um, up above behind me, there was like, I guess you'd call it a balcony or something right, right here and the choir would sit up there. And it was like a very traditional hymnal type thing and um, the service was ending, and I don't even remember what was happening, but the choir started to sing behind me. Don't remember any words except this. All I heard was, he died for me. And then they just held that note, he died for me. Like, oh, you know, really loud, like how, long time. Like, oh, yeah, it was like that, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and all of a sudden, it was like the love of God poured out on me in this tangible way that all of a sudden I had this realization. I didn't know what it meant. I knew enough to know there was a God and I knew enough to know that that God must know everything or he'd cease to be God. Like I knew that. So that meant this God who knew everything about me, the good, the bad, and the ugly, still loved me? Mm -hmm. Like in an instant, all of that just flooded my mind. And I started to cry, and in those years, I never cried, and I certainly wouldn't have done it in public. And so, um, because I didn't want anybody to talk to me, I went running out of the building, and I got in the car, and I was driving home, and I just sobbed all the way home. I just sobbed. I was like, you love me? Like, you know what I've done, and you love me. You guys, I'm never gonna get over that, and I hope I never do. Mm -hmm because it's nothing I ever did. And so that began my journey of, I gotta know this God who loves me like that. I gotta know, I gotta know him. I wanna experience him. I wanna understand him, which 
He's incomprehensible, otherwise he wouldn't be God. But when he reveals his love to you, it will change your life. And originally I didn't understand the doctrine of justification. I just knew he loved me. I knew he died for me. I knew he'd forgiven me. And then as I, I grew and I studied and I learned, and I'm like, wait a second, wait, 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 wait. So God the Father, when you look at me, because I'm in Christ, you see Jesus, because his blood covers me. Not because I've done anything good, simply because you've chosen to love me. That will change your life, because the more you meditate on that truth, the more you will find yourself going, well, how can I be mad at that person? And how can I hold out my love towards them when God loved me when I was still yet a sinner? Mm. And that's really what changed my life. It began the trajectory of changing our lives and recognizing every time I, I have a hard time forgiving somebody or I'm mad at somebody, I hear this little whisper, remember, Remember who you were when I set my mind to love you. Mm -hmm. When you think about, about that, sometimes we overcomplicate stuff. Sometimes we just don't wanna obey and so we overcomplicate it. Or we don't wanna risk, well, what if I'm rejected? As we talk about being a color-blessed people, the forces of darkness don't want you to give away what God has graciously given to you. And it's not something we force, it's like God tenderizes our hearts. I'm about to read a passage of scripture, Galatians 3, 24 through 29. And the apostle Paul is building the color blessed church of Galatia where Jews and Gentiles were at each other's throat. How did he get them to love each other? He says this, the law. The law is not only the Ten Commandments, it's circumcision for little boys at eight years old, it's eating kosher, it's celebrating Jewish festivals. Understand this, in the ancient world, the color of your skin did not determine your ethnicity, it was your religious practices. So what made a Jewish person a Jewish person was the law. So the law then was our guardian until Christ so that we may be justified or declared righteous by faith. But since that faith has come, we're no longer under a guardian. Now watch this. For through faith, you're all sons of God in Christ Jesus. Now this is important. For Jewish people in the first century, when they hear sons of God, their immediate thought is to think about the nation of Israel collectively, male and female, in slavery in Egypt, where God tells Pharaoh through Moses, let my son go. So the term son is not misogynistic, it's not patriarchal, what it's describing is a belovedness, just like men are called the bride of Christ. Well, this is a term of belovedness that all who have faith in Jesus, Jesus are sons of God. Yeah. So that means your brothers and sisters who are Democrat. That means your brothers and sisters who are Republican. That means your brothers and sisters, regardless of whatever ethnicity, we are called sons of God and respect is due because of what Christ has done. And then it goes on. Paul goes on. For those of you who were baptized into Christ, that means when we believe Christ, we're baptized into Christ and we get a new jersey called righteousness. Have been clothed with Christ. This is why physical baptism is so important. In a few weeks, we're gonna have another baptism. So if you have not been baptized as a believer, as your own, it's important to identify not only with Jesus, but also your brothers and sisters of different ethnicities. Baptism is the ground rules for living in a color-blessed culture because if you wear Jesus' righteousness and I wear Jesus' righteousness, we honor God by honoring each other and the blood that he spilled. Do not let politicians divide what Jesus bled to unite. Friends, I was in Washington, D.C. Uh, Tuesday and Wednesday. Speaking to senators, y'all know how much I love politics. 
on both sides of the aisle to say, how can we have secure borders? How can we help dreamers? How can we actually do immigration reform in a sense that's reasonable and sensible like most Americans think? I left her like, oh, Lord, Jesus, get me out of here. Don't be a chess piece. Don't be a chess piece that's moved around and manipulated. Let God's kingdom dictate your truth. One of the ways you know you're in God's kingdom is you love people and you care about their pain. That's like number one. Is you go, oh my goodness, what would Jesus think? How would Jesus feel about mothers leaving a country where there's drug lords and you hear about the great America, because you remember America has this big old statue and on it it says, bring your tired and your weary. Do y'all remember that was written there? Because a lot of our ancestors, well, some of y'all ancestors came that way not too long ago from Europe and other places to come to this great country. Now, I'm not saying you do that illegally. I'm not saying that at all. But what I'm saying is we should care. Can we care about more than just ourselves? Because when we begin to care with the compassion of Jesus, oh my God, we become a new species. We become a new people. You think think your dream is a better job? That ain't gonna make you happy. You're gonna be bored in a month. Headhunter gonna call you, you're gonna leave again. You're gonna have 88 jobs, thinking it's gonna bring you satisfaction. You're gonna bring you singing a song. I can't get no satisfaction because satisfaction ain't found in created things. Satisfaction is found in the uncreated creator. He's saying, come to me and let me teach you how to love. Come to me and let me show you mercy. Come to me and I'll show you grace. Satisfaction is found in him. And we join with King, King David. He says this. Your love is better than life, and I will praise you with my lips. That's why we talk about upward, inward, outward all the time, because this is God's heartbeat. There's neither Jew nor Greek. What that's saying is our ethnic distinctions are not erased, they're embraced. No one's better than anybody. At the foot of the cross, it's equal. Slave and free. In a few weeks, I'm going to teach on the Bible and slavery, what's happening here. This is more economic. 30 to 50% of the Roman world were indentured servants. It wasn't like the slavery that took place in America. It's a different deal, but the point is this. The CEO and the garbage man get treated the same. The teacher of first grade students get treated the same as a NASA scientist because everybody is made in the image of God. And then male and female, women are not second string. Women are co-heirs and co-equals in Christ. Look what it says next. Since you're all one in Christ Jesus, family, we're one. It's already done. We just need to walk in it. And teenagers and young people, you got to lead the way. Now, listen, I'm going over just a little bit, but this is important. The older you get, the more stuff you get. And the more stuff you get, the more you're responsible for that stuff. And what happens is you get all that stuff and you lose your courage because you don't want to lose the stuff. Don't surrender your birthright to stuff. Don't let the world suck you dry and make you an empty shell of yourself at 50 after two marriages because you bought the lie, the passion you have the desire you have. Yeah, you may not know how to do everything right now, but God can use it. God can use it. He'll do it. He'll do it. Don't give in. Don't give in. Don't give in. Let him do it in you. Lead us. Show us how to do it. Teenagers and young adults, remind us to dream again. Show us courage. Because we got too much stuff to pay for. We're afraid to say something at our jobs because we might lose our 401ks. Man, I'm spitting in everything today. Okay, I'm almost done. Verse 29. And if you belong to Christ. Wow. Woo-hoo-hoo. Okay. Okay, okay. I, I, okay, just 30 seconds. Just give me 30 seconds. 
I mean, when I say his name, something happens. Think about it. You could belong to a fraternity or sorority. You could belong to a corporation. You could belong to a family. Oh, my, my, my. But to belong to Christ. Oh, the one whose love is better than life. The one who loved us when we didn't know what love was. The one who found us when we wasn't even looking. The one who was broken to heal our brokenness. The one who called our name before we even knew his. The one who was on his way before we knew we had a need. The name above all names. If you belong to him, then you're Abraham's seed. Remember I told you long ago about God made a promise to Abraham? Well, Jesus is going, hey, Dad, here's Michael. Here's Jose. Here's Finn. Here's Samantha. I got them for you, Dad. I got them for you, Dad. You are Jesus' gift to his dad. That's who you are. Don't live less than who you are. His nail-pierced hands handed you to the Father. You've been created for majesty. Abraham's seeds, heirs according to the promise. You are the church that Jesus gave to his dad, and he wants to build his church.
Family, let's pray. The church is not an institution. It's not a building. It's people that Jesus bled and died for. It's people that he loved and justified. It's an every nation, tribe, and tongue people who have been loved so that they can love, who have been declared righteous so that they can see each other as righteous. For the world will know that you're my disciples by the way you love one another. I pray that Transformation Church would be known by the way we love Jesus, by loving each other and loving our world. Our world is so desperate for love and for belonging, for mercy and kindness. May, give, may we give away the mercy and kindness and love that we have received. Right now in this moment, I believe that there are many online and many who are physically present who have come to the realization, I don't know Jesus, I know about him, I know of him but I'm ready to know him intimately and personally. I'm ready to experience his love and forgiveness. I'm ready to enter into his righteousness. I'm ready to follow him and give him my life because he gave his life for me. Right where you are in the silence of your heart, today is your day of salvation. Today is your day of entering the Father's family. Today is your day of coming home to the Father's love. Today is the day that you have been created for, to be known and to know King Jesus, the lover of your soul. In the silence of your heart, the Bible is very clear. It says if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus died and was raised on the third day for your sins, you will be saved, you will be rescued, you will be saved from sin and death and evil, and you will be saved for worship and love in his kingdom. He'll clean you up, he does the work. Today's your invitation into his church. Today's your invitation into his love. Whether if you're a teenager, whether if you're 70 years old, anywhere in between, today is your day. Today's the day that you say yes to him. His nail-pierced hands are extended towards you and he's calling you home. Right where you are in the silence of your heart, I want you to say this. Today, King Jesus, I bow my knee before you. And I believe that on that bloody, rugged cross, it should have been me, but it was you. You took my place to give me grace so that I could find space in your family. I believe that your blood says I love you. I believe that your blood eternally forgives me. I believe that your blood declares me righteous. And I believe that on the third day when you walked out of that tomb, which became a womb of life, you brought me out with you. 
I am born again, I am made new. You are Lord and King, and I choose to follow you. In your name I pray, and God's people said, amen, amen, and amen. Can we give the Lord a round of applause? Amen. You may be seated, family. Before we move into our soul tattoo and action step, if you are watching from home by TV, a QR code is gonna pop up. Grab your smartphone, open up the camera app, point it at the QR code. It's gonna take you to our connection page and let us know that you prayed to receive Christ or renewed your faith in Christ. Why is that important? We wanna celebrate with you. Uh, number two, we wanna help you grow because of technology and microsites we're developing. We can connect with you and disciple you wherever you are in the world. If you're here physically and you don't have a physical connection card, I want you to do the same thing because there's a QR code right on the seat in front of you. Let us know you prayed to receive Christ. Let us know you renewed your faith in Christ. Everybody else with a physical QR code, uh, QR code, a physical connection card, let us know as well. Uh, baptisms are coming up. We wanna celebrate with you. We want to know uh, because God wants to do an epic, epic work in your life. Yeah. All right? And our soul tattoo this week is you are loved and justified by the blood. So our hope is if you met Jesus decades ago, that you remember that. And if you met him today, that you know that. Yeah. And our action step is this. Join us on Sunday, May 22nd, for part two of what is our color-blessed culture.